Hello everybody, and welcome back to another video. In this video, we're going to be covering the Cartesian vector notation. Now notice how it says notation. So this kind of alludes to the idea that we are going to express our vectors in a very specific way. So with that being said, let's jump into the video. So Cartesian vector notation, or as a lot of people call it CVN, provides us with an alternative method of analyzing vectors, and more importantly, it specifically addresses the challenges that we had with the parallelogram method. Those challenges being namely the heavy reliance on trigonometry. The second thing is adding multiple vectors is complex and time consuming. Remember that we said if we have three or more vectors, we can't really do it. We have to go two vectors at a time and slowly work our way up to the number of vectors that we have. Now the last problem that I have, and I say I because it's not a problem you guys will have yet, but later on it will be, that is it is hard to program. As you guys are going to see later, everything in engineering can be done very nicely using a computer. If we have a problem where it's basically just trigonometry, it's very hard to program that problem. This Cartesian vector notation method, as we're going to see, is going to be very simple to program and will allow us to do a lot of things very quickly. So the Cartesian vector notation is based upon resolving vectors into components on an orthogonal axis system, where orthogonal is basically perpendicular. Now that sounds like a lot of word garbage, but it's actually very nice because an orthogonal axis system is something you guys are already used to. You may not know it yet, but for instance, it's a simple X and Y coordinate system. As we can see, the X axis and the Y axis, they're perpendicular to each other. They form a nice 90 degree angle, and that is going to be the key to making our lives easier. So let's say that they gave us a vector, vector f, and we have its magnitude, and we have an angle defined by this vector. Well, what we can actually do is we can take this vector and separate it into two components. The first one is going to be the component in the x direction, which I call fx, and the second one is going to be its component in the y direction, fy. Now notice, just like the previous method, the parallelogram method, we created a triangle. But in this particular case, it's very nice because we have a right triangle where we have a 90 degree angle. Therefore, if I'm looking for these two components, fx and fy, well, it's actually a very nice formula where f is simply going to be the magnitude of our vector multiplied by cosine theta, and fy is going to be f multiplied by sine theta. But keep in mind where this angle is. This angle is with the x-axis. If it's with the y-axis, you're going to have to flop, <laughs> flip or flop the cosine and the sine. So don't forget that. It's something where a lot of students get used to using cosine for the x-axis, and if we give them the angle with the y-axis, just by default they'll still use cosine, but just keep that in mind that this is for an angle that's measured with respect to the x-axis. Now, the reason why this is nice is because it limits where our components can be. Remember before when we had vectors, they could be any sort of direction. We would normally say that this vector is, let's say, 100 pounds or 100 newtons, and it's located 32 degrees with the x-axis. We don't have that problem anymore because if we look at the components, they're going to be one of two things, either perfectly horizontal or going to be perfectly vertical. So this really helps us limit the amount of possible directions we can have. Now, more specifically, if we're looking at the horizontal direction, this limits our vector directions to one of two cases. Our vector can either be going to the right or it can be going to the left. That's it for the x direction. Same with the y direction. Our vector can either be going up or it can be going down. So since we only need two things to define these components, what we do for simplicity is we simply add a positive or a negative sign to these vector components to indicate their direction. So for the vertical direction, remember, we can only go up or we can go down. So what we do is we say a vector that is going upwards is going to be positive, and a vector that is going downwards is going to be negative. That one's very intuitive. I'm sure you guys have dealt with that before. Similarly, for the vertical, or not vertical, horizontal direction, uh, we define going right as positive and going left as negative. Nice and easy. So for these components, we simply made complex vectors that rely upon angles into simple magnitudes that can be just positive or negative. And whether it's positive or negative, you will know which direction it's going. So remember at the very beginning, when I talked about Cartesian vector notation, notation. You guys are thinking, what does that mean? Well, in Cartesian vector notation, we actually define our vector in a very specific manner. And in this case, we actually define it according to its components. So if I have a vector f, in Cartesian vector notation, or CVN, I would define the vector as such. 
where it has the x component, fx, and what we say is the i direction, plus the y component, fy, in the j direction. So this is going to be for 2D cases. We have an x component and we have a y component. And you're saying, Clayton, why are you hinting at 2D? Does this mean we're going to be doing 3D? Well, unfortunately, yes, that's the topic of next week, 3D vectors. But don't worry, Cartesian vector notation is very nice in that it allows us to extend to 3D very simply. Because if we look here, we have an X component and a Y component, so the two directions. And if we think about 3D space, all we're doing is adding that third direction. So for 3D, it would simply be FXI plus FY in the J direction, plus that third component FZ multiplied by K. So the key here to keep in mind is when we're talking about which directions, we actually use these i, j's, and k's. So in this particular case, we're using i, j, k to define the x, y, z directions. Now you may be saying, Clayton, why exactly are we doing this? Well, I think it's because we typically use the variable x as a variable. So I can't say, if I had it as a variable, I can't say we're going x in the x direction. It starts to get confusing. So for simplicity, we always use i, j, and k to define the x, y, and z directions respectively. So if you ever see an i, it means it's going in the horizontal or x direction. If you ever see a j, it's referring to the vertical direction. And when you guys see a k, it'll be that third 3D direction. Now, you guys may be saying, Clayton, this is still a little bit confusing. How about we go through an example? And I completely agree. So let's say that we have a vector f here, and we know its angle with the horizontal axis. So using the formulas before, we can split it into two components. We can say that the x component is, let's say, 4, and the y component is 3. If I wanted to write this in Cartesian vector notation, it would look like the following, where we have 4i plus 3j. Again, i is with the horizontal direction, j is with the vertical direction, and notice how both of these components are positive. If we look at the horizontal component, it is going to the right. Therefore, it's going to be positive. And if we look at the vertical component, Fy, it is also going, it's going upwards, sorry, so it's also going to be positive. Now, if I were to take this same vector, but switch its direction, so now it's going to the left and downwards, again, the components will always be positive. Those magnitudes are always going to be positive, but if I wanted to write this in Cartesian vector notation, it would look like the following, where I say negative 4i minus 3j. So again, both components are now negative because it's going to the left and it's going downwards. And I can flip this any way I want. So if we have the third case where it's now going left but upwards this time, I would write this vector as negative 4i, the negative because it's going to the left, plus 3j, positive because it is going upwards. So as you guys can see, this allows us to very quickly write vectors and it eliminates that need for always defining angles with the vectors. I just have my i, j, and k, and I put the components out in front of them. So the extension from 2D to 3D may sound complex, but it's actually very simple because we're only doing one thing and that is adding a component to our Cartesian vectors. So remember in 2D, if I had a force vector, we said that this can be split into two components, fx and fy, and I can write the vector as such, where my force vector is simply fx in the i direction plus fy in the j direction. In three dimensions, it's actually going to be the exact same thing. This three-dimensional vector can be split into three components that are parallel to each axis. So I'd have fy, fx, and of course fz. And you guys may have guessed writing this is just as simple. It's going to be the same format as before, but the only difference is at the end we add that third component. So what we'd say is we have fz in the k direction. So the k, that's going to be our third direction, if you will, and fz is going to be the components of our force in that direction. Now, the first thing that comes to 3D that students start to hate is something called the right-hand rule. Because typically what's going to happen in exam scenarios is that professors will label the x-axis and the y-axis, but they won't label the positive z-axis. Now, us as engineers, we always think, oh, positive is always up, right? So we're thinking, oh, we're good to go. It's always going upwards. But actually, the positive z direction follows something called the right-hand rule. Now, you guys may be saying, Clayton, what does that mean? Well, let's go over it. It's a series of steps. So if I want to find the positive z axis, or if I have, let's say, the x and z axis, I can find the positive y axis. All I'm going to do is point my fingers in the direction of the positive x axis. I'm going to then curl my fingers 
towards the positive y-axis, and whatever way my thumb is pointing is actually the direction of the positive z-axis. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, that was garbage. I don't understand what you said at all. Can you give me an example? Well, yes, of course, that's the best way to learn these things. So let's say that in an exam scenario, you're given again the positive x-axis and the positive y-axis. Now again, by default, we always assume that the positive z-axis is going to be upwards. But if we follow the right-hand rule in this scenario, so again, first step, I'm going to take my four fingers of my right hand, so make sure this is your right hand. It's called the right-hand rule for a reason. And I'm going to point my fingers at the positive x-axis, so it's kind of to the side here. Now, the second step is I want to curl my fingers towards the y-axis. So the y-axis, of course, is going this way, so I want to curl my fingers. Now notice that if I want to curl my fingers, the only logical way to do that is if my thumb is down. So in this particular case, the z-axis is actually going downwards because if we look, I'm curling my fingers and my, act, and my thumb is pointing downwards. Notice that I can point my fingers at the x-axis, but I can't curl this way. So this is why it's not going upwards. The only way I can curl is if my thumb is going downwards. So in this particular scenario, the positive z-axis is actually going downwards. Now let's look at the opposite scenario. In this case, we flipped where the x and the y-axis are. So in this case, I'd be pointing towards the x and I'm able to curl to the y-axis. And as we can see, my thumb is now sticking up. So again, I'm gonna curl this way. My thumb is sticking up. So therefore the positive z-axis in this case is actually upwards. So yep, yeah, that's it for this video. I wanna thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video.